Hello, it's Rico Tice here speaking from All Souls Langham Place, where I've been on staff here in central London for 25 years as an evangelist. Of course, my job as an evangelist is Ephesians 4, verses 10, 11, and 12, to prepare God's people for works of service. It's not just to do it myself, it's also to equip the church family to be doing it themselves. Let's pray as we begin. Oh, Father, please speak to us. Speak to us from the Bible and equip us that we may equip others to speak of Jesus. And Lord, you know you've done a miracle in our hearts. So the thing we most long for amid all the depravity is that people glorify Christ. They honour him. Please help us to do that in, that in this session. Amen. Whenever I'm training people for evangelism, I always start by saying, could you please write down two names of a Christian and a non-Christian? And then, could you listen for them, not just for yourself? Now that prevents some people there who maybe, maybe you've been doing evangelism for years. You're just thinking, well, what can this guy give me? That's hopeless, really. Much better that you listen as a river where it comes to you and you're thinking of these two people, Christian and non-Christian, than as a reservoir, it just goes into you. And I found that transformed it as a young evangelist as I was trying to speak. It transformed things because... I found that even people who'd, who'd been around a long time, someone like John Stott would sometimes be in the congregation, but when he was listening for his friends, who to train and who to try and lead to Christ, you could see it change the listening. Well, with that in mind, what's the key word we've got to get in place as we train people for evangelism? Brothers, sisters, the key word is confidence. People have got to be confident as they do this work. And so what passage do we go to, which is a great passage for equipping them on the how of evangelism and to fill them with confidence? Well, I think the most important passage on evangelism in the Bible is 2 Corinthians 4, verses 1 to 6. I wonder if you could turn to that now. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 1 to 6. John Chapman, the Australian evangelist, taught me this is the most important passage on evangelism. And I have a rule at my church. I try and teach this to somebody each week. So someone in the church family, I open this up with, or in some way open it up, because it's just so crucial. And it gives us the key principles for evangelism. So as we think about evangelism, biblical evangelism, here are the principles here. Now, as we read it together, here's my question for you. And please jot this down as you train others, as you're a river. Who is at work in the work of evangelism? Who's at work in the work of evangelism? Can you hold that in mind as we read the verses? Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we don't lose heart. So it's easy to lose heart, but because of God's mercy we don't. Rather, we've renounced secret and shameful ways. We don't use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age, isn't that a brilliant definition of Satan, the God of this age, because he blinds people to only seeing this age. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers, so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. So who's at work in the work of evangelism? And I let people look at that in pairs. And I'm hoping that they'll come back to me with verse 5. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. So what do we do in evangelism? And this is the heart of our mandate. We preach Jesus, but... Brothers and sisters, did you hear it? As Lord. That's the Jesus we preach. So we preach Christ. That's what we're to be doing. We're speaking of Jesus. Evangelism is about talking about Jesus. The Father sends him, the Spirit illumines him. He's the one we're to speak of, our Lord Jesus Christ. What a, what a joy, what an honour. As we do that, now this is key for confidence. What is God doing? Can you see verse 6? Crucial we teach this. What, what powers at work as we preach Jesus rather pathetically? Verse 6, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness. Now, where's that from? That's what you ask. Where's that from? 
Genesis 1. The God who said, let there be light in Genesis 1, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. In other words, God who created the world and said, let there be light, then recreates our hearts. He takes the same power that made the world, he shines it into my heart. Here's the key word. He does a miracle and causes me to see the glory of God displayed in the face of Christ. In other words, he gets me to see that Jesus is God. So brothers and sisters, conversion is a moment of recognition. It's a moment of identification. I see who Jesus is. So he's not just a, a swear word or a figure of history or a great prophet. He's Lord and God. And why do I see that? Because God has done a miracle and recreated my heart. So as you rather pathetically try and speak of Jesus, God is at work opening blind eyes. And that is evangelism. I wonder if, I don't know what it would be in your heart language, but it's we preach Christ, God opens blind eyes. And that's what I get people to chant. My job is to speak of Jesus. And as I do that, God will open blind eyes. Okay, so question one, who's at work in the work of evangelism? We are as we preach Christ. God is as he does a miracle and opens blind eyes. Okay, second question for this passage, do jot it down as you look to train others. How do we preach Christ? We are to preach Christ, but the passage gives us at least four things on how to preach Christ. I wonder if you can see verse two. We've renounced secret and shameful ways. We don't use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience. So we preach Christ as Lord and we say the tough bits. Now in the English culture, the two places where people are very fearful of speaking are about God's wrath, his settled, controlled, personal hostility to evil, the fact that Jesus as Lord stands at the head of history and there'll be a judgment day. By the way, we float that. So of course it's a wonderful thing. It means how I treat you matters to God, how you treat me matters to God, how we treat the world matters to God. We float it with what people want in terms of justice, but we are to speak of God's wrath. And secondly, repentance. Now what is repentance? It means I'm for what Jesus is for, and I'm against what he's against. Do you know, uh, uh, at the beginning of COVID, the churches in this country called people to a day of prayer and action. It was the wrong call. It was a day of prayer and repentance. But at that point, I'm confronting the culture. So I've got to know that as I say, brother, sister, stop it within the church, or I say to a non-Christian, we must stop that. Jesus is Lord. I must know that the Holy Spirit will be regenerating people's hearts as I call them to repentance. Acts 11 verse 18, 2 Timothy 2, 24. So important for my confidence in evangelism. As I call you to stop, as I cross the pain line and do that, I'm trusting the Holy Spirit will be transforming you. But there'll also be rejection, which is why I've got to stay in view of God's mercy. We'll come to that a little later. So I've got to teach the truth state and that'll be about repentance and wrath, particularly in, in my domestic situation. But secondly, it's not just that. What else must I do? We need God to open blind eyes. That means I don't just preach. Brother, sister, it means I pray. So can I ask you, what time did you go to bed last night? Because I find if I don't get to bed, I don't get up to pray. And if I don't pray in the morning, I don't pray. But this is how we get the church family to pray. We say, don't you think you need a miracle? I need a miracle in my mates' friend, lives. And also verse four, if you look down, do you see? The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. We need a miracle because Satan has put cataracts on people's eyes. So all they can see is the holiday, the flat, the job, the apartment, the grandchildren. They can't see eternity. So we must pray. And then of course, oh, this is so important. The results belong to God. God has to switch the light on. So the results are his. Now, when I finish a mission, so often people say, well, how many were converted? What's the key question you should ask me? Verse five, Rico, did you preach Christ? And, and often I find evangelism, evangelists cut the price so more will buy because they think they're responsible for results. I'm not. The Lord is responsible for results. 
My job, though, is to keep telling the truth and in my tone to be for you, to have kindness in my heart, not to be vicious, which I find I am sometimes if I'm overtired. So we preach Christ, God opens blind eyes, we must pray, the results belong to God, we must make sure that we tell the truth, but also there's something else in verse 5, and this is another key principle of evangelism. We've got God's sovereignty, he opens blind eyes, gospel integrity, we tell the truth, but thirdly, there's creativity and humility in verse 5, and this is key as well. Can we have a look now? For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. So with my right hand rock solid on doctrine and belief, my left hand is saying, how do I reach for my audience across Europe, where I am locally? What does it mean to be their servant? So the only offence is the gospel. That's a huge issue. How do I serve those I'm speaking to? And of course, the passage that picks this up uh, so clearly is 1 Corinthians 9. You all know it well. Let me just read it to you now. Though I'm free and belong to no one, I've made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I came like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. He goes on, verse 22, to the weak I've become weak, to win the weak I've become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. Oh, how do I reach for people? What's the easiest time for them to come? Maybe, like in this culture, they won't really go to church. So what will they come to? How do I get the one-to-one -one work going in the church family so we can be flexible and go to people? What material can I put together that's the easiest for them to hear with? But how do I reach? And that requires energy. So these are the great three principles of evangelism. Everything over the last 25 years I've taught on evangelism has been under one of these three headings. God's sovereignty. The results belong to him. We need him to do a miracle. And therefore, the key word is we must pray. Secondly, gospel integrity. We must tell the truth. That might mean crossing the pain line, risking opposition. Thirdly, creativity. What does it mean to reach for people? Now you'll see up on your screens a slide that'll have those three themes. And then you'll see some other slides which, which ask the question, brother, sister, what happens if you miss one out? What happens if you've got integrity and you've got creativity but not sovereignty? You've forgotten the results belong to God. Well, what happens then? Well, you have a breakdown apart from anything else because the, the, we, we can never get enough work done. I've got to be able to go to sleep and leave it with him. What happens if I've got sovereignty and integrity, but I haven't got the creativity? Well, you know, how relevant is this? We can go on about the truth, but are we connected with people? And what happens if I've got sovereignty and creativity, but not integrity? What happens is, as in my culture, people are thinking, oh, don't say that, Rico. Don't mention the stuff on human sexuality because otherwise people will stop listening. What, what, what's the result then? As we create believers but not disciples. So those are the three themes and absolutely key. Now just then, okay, what am I then saying to people about preaching Christ? I find there are four steps that I'm again and again talking about. Number one, as you meet people, celebrate them. Celebrate people. What do you most enjoy? And at the heart of that celebration of people is realising that the Sovereign Lord has put them into your life. So I'm always going to Acts chapter 17 as I'm seeking to help people to celebrate who they meet because God has organised it. Let's have a listen. Acts 17, 24 to 27. Oh my goodness, how this passage transformed my confidence in evangelism. Now who is God in each of these as we celebrate those we meet? Who is God? Verse 24, here is Paul in Athens, and he says, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and doesn't live in temples built by human hands. Who is God there? He's the God who made the world. He's the creator. Next verse, verse 25. And he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. Who is God there? He's the sustainer. He gives each breath. And then thirdly, 
From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. Who is God there? He's the ruler. So God, the creator, sustainer, and ruler, has a plan for the world. Now, can we see what it is? It's in the next verse. Hold on to your seats. Are you ready? Verse 27. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. So God's plan for the world is that they meet his son, Jesus, is that people come to know Christ. I did history at university, but I never did the history of the world. The history I did wasn't real history. This is real history, how people come to know Christ before they meet him as judge of all the world. And, and so the confidence that it's given me, it means that my neighbours, well, I'm the most important person they know. Why? Because God has placed them there not to work in London so they can make a living. That's secondary. He's primarily placed them there to meet me. I'm the most important person they know because I know Jesus and history is about meeting him. I don't know what your plans are for the world, but my advice would be to align yourself with what the creator, sustainer and ruler says. It means that every relationship, oh, brothers and sisters, is a divine appointment. And therefore, as I meet a neighbour, they're made in God's image and I celebrate them, celebrate them. They're, God has put them there for you to meet. But secondly, we don't just celebrate them. Step two, as we preach Christ, we serve them. So there are going to be random acts of kindness. The Lord Jesus has died on the cross to serve them. The night before he died, he washed the disciples' feet. And so our identity is to be the servants of all, Mark chapter 10. Here we are to be servants. And, and again, in this individualistic culture, it's an amazing thing to be a servant. What does it mean as people arrive on your street and you show them how the recycling works and you welcome them with a box of chocolates or whatever? People are so glad to have it as we memorise their names and meet them and perhaps pop them down, start praying for them. So number one, celebrate them. And that's what do you enjoy? That's the question there. Secondly, serve them. What's your biggest stress? What's the thing that's most you're struggling with? But thirdly, cross the pain line. Thirdly, perhaps ask them in this COVID situation, do you ever think about spiritual things? Or as I train the church family as we head it to Christmas, do you celebrate Christmas? Perhaps even it'll be, there are these great little notes, the word one-to-one, -one, where you get the questions and answers in, in John's gospel. Would you have a look at at a gospel with me. It's got the questions and answers, but why not have a look for yourself? Have you looked at the documents for yourself? Now, that crossing the pain line and, and, and asking those questions, raising the spiritual issue, will always be difficult. In fact, that phrase, cross the pain line, is something in, in this little book, Honest Evangelism, that, that I wrote that sort of came out most. We've got to train our people for that uncomfortable moment when we do that. So, so it's never going to be easy and I've, I've, got to, I've got to just say, no, Lord, I'm going to ask them at this point. Do you think about spiritual things? It, it is, it is a, a tough moment. And some people say, well, I feel uncomfortable with it. Well, yeah, it is uncomfortable. But brother, sister, how's uncomfortable? And that's what's at stake. Do I care more what they think of me now than of what Christ will think of them on Judgment Day? But fourthly, now this is key, exit. Matthew 10, 14, do you know when Jesus says, knock the dust off your feet. In other words, if they stop talking, you stop talking. So you might say, look, do you think about spiritual things? In the English culture, they just ignore it. Well, that's okay. Go back to celebrating and serving. But sometimes they'll say, well, look, my grandmother took me along to church. Well, at that point, you ask questions. We've got to be really good at asking questions. So, so you know, oh, really, she took you. Where was that? What did you make of it? So, so if, they, if they go quiet, you go quiet. But if they say something back, keep asking questions. So that's the how. Let's keep those things in place. The three great issues. Sovereignty, pray. Integrity, tell the truth. Creativity, energy. What does it mean to reach them? And then as I'm preaching Christ, celebrate people, serve them, uh, uh, cross the pain line, say something, but then exit if, if, if they're not up for it. Okay, as we just draw to a close now, I've I'm, 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 I'm just got five or six minutes left. The why. 
because I've got to understand, you know, why do I do this? I've got to keep mobilizing the church family. And let's remember Titus 1 verse 1, it's the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. So the way I motivate is by opening my Bible and giving them the scriptural motivations. I just don't say, I don't just say you must do this. I say, aren't these truths wonderful? How do we want to respond to them? Now, when it comes to the why, I always begin with this question. Do jot it down. What stops us doing evangelism? What are the things that stop us? Because it's great to hear people. And as I hear them, I'm asking myself, explore. What are they saying? Explore, listen, listen, listen. Explain, what's the next thing to teach? Thirdly, encourage. From your own life, how do you put flesh on that? But, but I'm listening to hear what they say. And time and again, of course, what comes back when you say what stops us? Well, right at the centre of the responses I find almost always is fear. People say, well, look, I'm going to get rejected if I, if I say something about Jesus. And at that point, it is so important as evangelists that we acknowledge that and say, yes, you will be rejected. Again, in Honest Evangelism, I, I wrote that book because we weren't being honest about the gospel, about wrath and repentance, and we weren't being honest about telling people that actually there is going to be rejection. So Matthew 10, 17, Jesus says, I send you out as sheep among wolves. Well, that's going to be brutal. So yes, I am going to get rejected. But here's the issue, and this is another key word. In my identity, I've got to have the grace of God. So that whether you accept or reject me doesn't make me more valuable. What makes me valuable is Christ died for me. So each day as I see my sin, as I, as I, I look again at God's grace, as I, I open my Bible in my quiet time, I see my sin, it's like a mirror. I feel God's forgiveness. How does God feel about me today? Answer, he's delighted with me. Why is he delighted with me? Because I relate to him through Christ's performance, not my own. And then joy comes and service. So it's sin, grace, joy, go out and serve. But I've got to have grace as the great driver for evangelism, alongside, of course, the glory of God. But grace. So what am I trying to get in place? I find time and again I'm doing Romans 1 verses 16 and 17. I find that time and again I want to go to those verses in order to be mobilized. Here they are. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, writes Paul in verse uh, 16 of Romans 1, because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first the Jew, then the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness is by faith, by, from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So amazingly, what happens is this. Jesus doesn't just die on the cross for my sin. That's amazing enough but he then gives me his righteous life. So as I look at all my sin, God says, yes, I see it, Rico. I'm sending my son to die, but now I'm giving you my son's righteousness. So here's a book, and in it is all the wrongdoing I've ever done. The Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner, Rico Tice. And can you see inside every page is blank? Because as God looks at me, amazingly, he sees me as Jesus. And Jesus has all my sin on him. So I don't so much live for approval, but from that approval. And is it your treasure, this gospel? That's the question. Do you know, when I was a little boy, my dad lived in Africa, and he used to bring back Asterix books. I loved Asterix. And when I got given one of these when he came back, it would be my treasure. I wanted nothing else. Is the gospel that? And if I see my sin clearly, then, I, then I, 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 I see where I should head to hell. I'm amazed I've been rescued and I want to tell others. Now again, on this rescue, let's not forget how urgent it is. There's only one Jesus and he speaks again and again of hell. So as a little bit of a mission statement, I often say to people, here's my mission statement. People without Christ go to hell. That's how urgent it is. And at the heart of the gospel, I'm saved from hell through the cross for heaven. So I'm longing to, to, to pass this warning on. Now, there are two ways of being in debt in Romans 1. One is that I owe someone money. But the second, the debt there is that, is that you give me money, I've got to pass it on. And until I pass it on, I'm in their debt. Well, we're in debt. 
So when did we last weep about the lost? I mean, where will they be in a hundred years' time? I've got to keep asking the congregation that. So Jesus speaks of hell and he dies to save us from that, and that's a huge motivation. And then as I close, why won't we speak? Well, again, in my, in my book, um, Honest Evangelism, I found I got enormous feedback on this. Um, we won't speak because actually there are idols that stop us speaking. If you've got someone who's a committed Christian, but they're not speaking, the question is, what are they worshipping? Where's their heart? What's kidnapped their heart? So what are their daydreams? What are their nightmares? I found over the last 25 years here, time and again, if people are not speaking about Jesus, it's because their hearts have been won by something else. They've stopped seeing the horror of their sin, the wonder of the rescue. There's something else that's captured their heart. So what are you living for? If I took a video of your life, what would it be saying? I've always got to be watching that. That so often stops us. It's the idols in our heart that prevent us speaking. We've got to be so aware in digging those out. When my grandmother died, she died without Christ. I didn't speak to her. And that was because of fear of my family and what they'd say. I so regret it. She's in God's hands. I leave her there. But I didn't speak because of the idol of fear fearing what my family would say. So let me finish there. We preach Christ, God opens blind eyes. Why do we preach Christ? Because of grace, because of the reality of hell, and it's the idol so often that will stop us doing it. I don't know what struck you most from that, but it's been a joy to be speaking to you. I hope there'll be something to take away so that you can be a river. What can you pass on? And I hope there'll be great confidence that it's God that's opened blind eyes. The reason I'm Christian is God did the miracle. And therefore, as we preach to others and speak to others, we can trust him to do the same.